1964. Hello? Can you hear? 1964, I was reading one of the showbiz magazines. I've, I've forgotten which one. But I read that Warner Brothers was going to film Cheyenne Autumn. And I thought, oh my gosh, John Ford was the director. I thought, this is big. So I immediately wrote to Mari Sandoz and I said, wow. Mari Sandoz encounters Hollywood is something I want to know. Well, there's a lengthy letter in uh, Helen Stauffer's book to me explaining, you know, Mari, whenever she didn't have an account down in some record, she'd make a carbon copy of the letters she wrote to people, all those hundreds of letters that uh, Helen beautifully put together in a very, very interesting book. And so she wrote this letter to me to get the story down. She told me that Warner Brothers had contacted her and she said no, and you know why. Her respect for Native American culture, Native American people, she did not trust Hollywood to deal with that culture in any fair or balanced or beautiful way that she would. She said no twice. And finally, the insult came. They said, Miss Sandoz, we have developed a script about the Cheyenne outbreak. That's an historical event. We want your title. You can't copyright titles, but if there is a title, in the general public, generally acknowledged, you've got to honor that. Well, she, well, she was really furious. But her agent kept saying, no. Tell him to go ahead. Give him the title. And also demand that you get some recognition on the screen. And they'll bring out the paper book uh, and you'll make money because you'll sell lots of copies because of that, that movie, which is exactly what happened. And if you saw the movie, and I hope you have it, <laughs> I, I mean that. And on the screen, it says, suggested by this book by Mari Sandoz. I thought the effrontery. But it's a fraud. The whole film is a fraud. Anyway, Mari told me that they paid her $7,500. Now, I'm really anxious to introduce to you Dr. Dave Neshheim. Uh, I, I always need my glasses. I'm sorry. Anyway, Dr. Neshheim has looked into the history of Mari Sandals and Hollywood extensively. I can't wait to hear what he has to say. He's a professor out at Shadow State College. He teaches Great Plains. He teaches English. He teaches history. He, he, call, he is best known as a his, historical environmentalist. Sure, environmental historian. Is that close? Yeah. Yeah. I don't but know if that's what I'm best known for, but that's a claim I made. I think the kids out there are lucky to have young professors like Dave there. And as I said, I'm I'm really eager to hear what you have to say. And thank you, Dave. Thank you, Ron. All right, when Mike Smith and the program committee were putting together this symposium for today, initially he proposed a section on Mari and Hollywood, and I kept my mouth shut. And then two weeks later, I thought, you know what? I've done a little bit of Hollywood research. I've done a little bit of film research, 
And there is one film that came out of Mari Sandoz's work. So if we're going to do her life, we really have to do Hollywood. So late addition to the program, at the very last, I am going to talk about Mari Sandoz and Hollywood. And I thought, at the very least, I'll play bad clips from Cheyenne Autumn <laughs> and tell you where the story should have gone as opposed to where the story ended up. But thanks to Courtney Kuba, who is outside, and her incredibly efficient use of the finding aid and highlighting letters. Um, over the course of a couple days, I was able to spend some time at Sando Center in Shadron, rapidly going through microfilm and just looking for those specific moments where, where titles or Hollywood pop up in the letters. Um, along the way, I get distracted because that's what researchers do. Uh, I'm on Twitter, and so I was broadcasting out the kind of delightful things I found. Um, and so this talk ended up going in places that I really didn't anticipate when I started. The title shot comes from two different letters. And when I told Ron how I was going to approach the subject, he immediately disagreed with my interpretation. So I think we're really, really going to have some fun this morning. And hopefully, you will find my evidence compelling. So, you want me to take off my Darth Vader mask? Yeah. All right. I don't do this as a general rule because I teach at a place where there's no mask mandates or no vaccine mandates, and so I've gotten quite used to living the life of the mask. Okay, pretty hopeless with a seal skin jacket, Mari Sandos in Hollywood. Let's get going. I was totally shocked at the number of films that were proposed for a Hollywood adaptation. Um, on the left-hand column, we have Serious Hollywood Interest, Old Jewels, Slogum House, Miss Marissa, and Crazy Horse. There were either film rights licensed, there were scripts that were developed, there was serious Hollywood interest. The other titles, Capital City, Son of a Gambling Man, and The Cattleman, may be as sort of random as a friend of Mari writing saying, oh, I love The Cattleman, is this going to become a film? You know, that kind of thing. So we've, we've hinted at the idea that Mari Sandos was a freaking big deal. And one thing that really came through in my research is just kind of how big of a deal she was. Um, so anyway, it's, there's lots of people who are pro proposing film adaptations, some of whom I've never even heard of before. Um, I'm going to really, really pay close attention to letters. As Shannon suggested, this is not a comprehensive list of the letters. These are the letters that survived the culling process from when they left New York to their stay in Gordon and then finally back to Lincoln. And each one of these little entries, typically either Mari would write a letter and then a letter would come back or a letter would come to Mari and then she'd respond. So if we have two letters in a year, really we're probably talking about one sort of Hollywood encounter. Uh, does this have a pointer? How, how cool can I be? Uh, I didn't have a pointer. All right, um, right here, we've got Old Jules. Before J Old Jules was even published, she had between three and five legitimate Hollywood um, feelers put out. Eventually, I'll tell that story in a little bit. Um, as soon as Slogum House comes out, Old Jewels and Slogum House are paired whenever they're talking about Hollywood, either develop Old Jewels or Slogum House. Um, during World War II and immediately after, Slogum House was really, really seemed like it was going to be made. Um, and then in the 50s, we get the Crazy Horse Saga both attempts at making her book into a movie and then a couple years later another really really horrible Hollywood version of Crazy Horse's Life um, that there's a lot of correspondence about and then finally at the very end we get Cheyenne Autumn that is literally an afterthought in my talk. It's not that important um, because by the time Cheyenne Autumn gets produced Mari Sandoz has a, has a rapprochement with Hollywood, right? She's come to terms, or at least that's my argument. All right. Um, here is the first letter. Well, the first letter I'm going to highlight. Um, this is Mari to her first film agent, Harold Ober. And uh, she says, um, what? I've 
10 years in the face of starvation, I also love the fact that typing is hard, 10 years in the face of starvation, she worked so hard to get this book out, she's not going to sell it short at this point in time. And then she tells Harold Ober, probably it's not even worth your time reading. Uh, she really has an interesting relationship with Harold Ober. So early on, we've got Mari Sandos the way we would think about her. Resistant to Hollywood, steadfast in her writing, and refusing to compromise, right? Um, and it's old jewels, so this is a really sort of different story for her personally than some of the later works where she's not directly biologically tied to the thing, if you will. All right. Um, then we get a letter from Ober to Mari Sandos. Now this is after MGM has got the film rights, the, the production is moving down the line in a Hollywood sense. And Metro Goldwyn are not willing to stipulate in the contract that Mari Sandos would have final editing rights on the film. <laughs> Gall, what do we call that? Um, uh, ownership, something like that? Uh, yeah, anyway, uh, I just think that's kind of funny. The next paragraph in this letter is then Ober talking about how much the director respects Mari's work and how much the director wants to get it right. I just think it's interesting, that, you know, the really stark aspects of Mari being Mari in this instance, you know. Um, Old Jules still looks like it's going to happen. And Mari is giddy, perhaps. She wants to push this thing down the road. She reaches out to Dwight and Truby, who I don't know who they are, but I know someone could tell me who they are. Say, say it again, Jameson. Dwight Kirsch. Dwight Kirsch. And commissions a portfolio of images in case she goes to Hollywood so she could really be professional and upfront and, and ready to go with this film project. And those images still exist in Shadron, I believe. Uh, I just think it's kind of interesting. She, she's distant, she's distrustful, and yet you might say she's all in. Especially if she's going to be spending... Let's see, 25, 100 sandwiches, Meg, is that about right? About 100 sandwiches on this portfolio for a film that may not come to fruition. So in this initial time period, there's lots of letters back and forth, um, all on company letterhead. And it seems like Irving Thalberg, who is the boy wonder of Hollywood, is going to direct the film. And then he gets ill, the film is taken back off the burner, he eventually dies. Um, David Selznick is mentioned by Harold Ober as a possible next director, but that never comes to fruition. One of the weird things that, that happens, uh, coincidence is Thalberg was supposed to direct Gone with the Wind, but his health was compromised and so he wasn't able to do that project. And then Selznick actually does direct Gone with the Wind, and both of them were in consideration for Old Jewels. I don't know what that means. I just thought it was kind of interesting. All right. Throughout the correspondence, throughout the 27, 29 years that Mari is in some capacity of trying to get a Hollywood film going, she has lots of support from Nebraskans, from people she's met in her travels, from people who just reach out to her kind of from nowhere. And the most supportive and the most persistent is Fred Ballard. Fred Ballard is a Nebraska playwright, and these are just four films that he had success in getting his work adapted to the Hollywood screen. He's connected in Hollywood, he's connected to Mari, and he's intermittently um, cajoling and sort of chiding her for not getting films made and also attempting to get films made. And I think that's really important when we think about Mari in Hollywood. She's busy writing, she's busy speaking, she's busy um, traveling. And so even though Hollywood is a consistent part of her life, it's not something that I think she invests a lot of emotion or time into. And yet, as part of that big deal that she is, there's pretty much constantly some movement to get something made into a Hollywood film. Um, yeah, it's interesting. 
Okay, so this is a letter from Mari to Fred Ballard, and it's just beautiful, it's just beautiful Mari prose. This is talking about Harold Ober, the favorite agent of the Atlantic people. She kind of downplays her decision to take Harold Ober as an agent uh, later on because it doesn't bring success. And she refers to him, a gentleman skier rather above the sordid business of life as portrayed in old jewels. I don't even know what a gentleman's skier is, but it certainly is not good. I just think that is so beautiful. Although she does give him right, credit for getting the MGM film license, and so there is, there is some, some begrudging respect between the two, I guess you might say. And then in here, there's also the nibbles on Slogum House. Problem with this, at least one of the problems, is who is going to play Old Jules? Early on, when Thalberg is still in the picture, there's talk of having Emil Jannings come back from Germany and play the old Jules role. And this is the only time in the correspondence where Mari Sandos becomes a legitimate fangirl. She writes to Harold Ober and says, finally, a reason for me to be excited about a film adaptation. She goes on to finish the letter, and then the final sentence in the letter is, and isn't that something about Emil Jennings? You know, she's just, she's, you can just see it. You know, she's happy. Uh, I did a little research. Turns out later on, our guy EJ has a little um, relationship with something called the Nazi Party. But at the time, he was a respected um, actor. And then much later on, Pat Dugan, who's another one of these figures who shows up in the correspondence pitching Hollywood films, had lunch with Gary Cooper and pitch Gary Cooper as old Jules. Quick show of hands, who can visualize that one? <laughs> okay. Gullah Slogum, going to be made into a film. Serious, serious effort at this. Again, the stumbling block is who's gonna be the lead. Ethel Barrymore is proposed. Blanche Yerba is proposed. I sort of know the Barrymore name. These were, you know, significant players at the time. And, uh, and Mari, is, she's kind of funny. She's like, I'm completely out of my depth in picking lead actors for uh, Gula, right? She's not really interested in this. Another example I would suggest of just the big dealness of this. All right. She gets tired of Harold Ober. She gets a different agent named Jacques Schomburg, and then finally in 1942, she develops a relationship with Audrey Wood, and Audrey Wood becomes her film agent for the rest of, the, of her life. Um, Audrey Wood, the first letter she writes to Mari Sandos is just effuse praise and flattery for the first couple paragraphs, and I think it's safe to say that with Mari, flattery will get you everywhere, uh, but they have a great relationship. It's really, the, the letters are delightful. Um, and then I just put this in. Fred Ballard, a Nebraska booster, has always felt I frittered away my opportunities. <laughs> uh, I, I just, I, I'd love to know the conversations they had in person, not just in the letters, you know. Uh, very clearly supportive Mr. Ballard is, and yet there's some tension in there all the same. Okay. We're going to back up a little bit. When you're going through microfilm rolls, they're very long and they're thousands of letters and you're looking for one in November and one in January. And so you're just quickly scanning through and sometimes you stop to check where you are in the, in the calendar, right? And any time I would stop and find a letter from H, I would read it because they were always fun. H being Helen Hayes or as she signed one letter, Helen Mary. Hell and Mary, all one word with two little apostrophes in between them. Uh, delightful stuff. This is a letter dated Friday night to my dearest girl from Helen Hayes to Mari. Friday night, don't know what year, but it's in the time period when the bad Crazy Horse movie is coming out. Of course it's a compliment in a loathsome sort of way. Uh, you know why I'd stop and read them, right? It's just delightful. 
As I was posting on Twitter about the letters that made me laugh, especially the ones from H, I got a direct message from someone who I'm not going to mention about an aspect of this story that I'm not going to mention, but it raised all kinds of questions adjacent to the ideas that Jameson Wyatt was talking about this morning. Um, I talked to my wife about it, and she said, how would you go about reevaluating an author in that significant way, if you know what I'm saying? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know how that would work at all. I mean, I know how historical revision as a process works, but I don't know how you change someone's biography, necessarily. So I reached out to a bunch of Sando scholars, and Lisa Pollard, who is in the back row, and I had a nice conversation. And one of the things that we agreed upon is when you look at Mari's correspondence, the significant, the really significant, meaningful relationships in her life are primarily with women. And many of the details about Hollywood that are illuminating come from letters between Mari and other women. Sometimes professional women, sometimes uh, familiars, you know, intimate acquaintances, whatever it may be. And, um, Right, Helen does a really nice job of encapsulating the crazy horse controversy. I think I'm going to move forward, but I'm not done talking about crazy horse yet. Okay, yes, perfect. I was hoping this was next. So this is Annie Laurie Williams. Um, this is, I'm sorry, this is Mari writing to Marguerite Young about a film adaptation. And this is when... Gregory Radoff had taken a six months option on Mari's Crazy Horse, right? This is in 52, and the bad Hollywood Crazy Horse film comes out in 54, 55, a couple years later. Um, and here is when I like, realized I might have an argument for my talk. I certainly had a title for my talk, and it started to make a little bit more sense. So what happens here is they took out a six-month option on Crazy Horse, and Mari went out and bought a sealskin jacket. She goes on to say she's going to be, um, got a year of work on Buffalo Hunters. She can't be bothered looking for a wardrobe, so it's going to be her tweed great coat, no suits, no dresses, no nothing, just a sealskin jacket, you know, and just, and just being fabulous in that way. So what is Hollywood to Mari Sandos in 1952? a source of frustration, a source of income, a source of pride, I want to say, right? Fred Ballard is saying, you've frittered away these opportunities. You should have movies made. He constantly tells her, if Old Jules was a film, it'd, it'd win the Academy Award. If Slogan House was a film, it'd win the Academy Award. You know. um, so I think there's a, there's a real tension within her about Hollywood, but fundamentally, money is good, right? And film rights are a really easy way for Mari to make money, and here to this point, there's never been a film made. So she licenses the film rights, no harm, no foul, no big deal. She gets a little walking around money or maybe some, some money for clothes. I got curious about money, Mari's financial situation. And so I started looking for letters that might give me a clue. I didn't put it in my talk for today, but I found one instance where Saks Fifth Avenue sends her a letter about a bill for about $114 that's outstanding. And she replies and says, I've been busy, I've been traveling, you obviously didn't get my check for $83. But again, in the sandwich, sandwich reference or the steak dinner reference, that's kind of a chunk of change. And all I'm trying to say by that is that she needed money, right? And Hollywood is a really good way to make money. And the sealskin coat maybe suggests that, you know, as she goes through life, she's, she's putting on airs. She's, she's making a public presence of herself. Um, I was really struck in the interview how she spoke. Ron? How she spoke, how Mari spoke, her, her diction. It seemed not very Sand Hills to me. Did anybody get that sense? 
So, so did you notice, because you knew Mari, and you, you knew her for a long time, did she speak in ways that were different than Flora or? You know that German was her original language. Uh-huh. And that did affect how she spoke a bit. Yeah. I think it also affected how she wrote. Mm hmm Particularly. Yeah, so. But uh, we did many TV shows with her, and she was always articulate, and, and she had good diction. You could always understand what she said. The clip you showed. Yeah. So, so Ron, I need one of these. I'll just recap what Ron said real quick. German was her was her first language, and she was always very articulate and spoke spoke very clearly. I guess what I'm trying to, to get at is like the development of a public persona, the development of being a respected writer, a, a, you know, the 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 conscious presentation of her image as opposed to the things that come through in the letters and the private relations, right? This sort of this this disparity. Okay, here's the, here's the quote. Um, she writes back to Joe Dugan about Gary Cooper. I can't see the word bound Gary Cooper as the voluble, exceedingly articulate jewels. <laughs> ah, just let that soak in for a second. And then she says, nobody's ever going to make a film about my books. Maybe in a generation some Frenchman will do it. You know? And I'm thinking like she's anticipating you know, independent foreign film, kind of you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and sadly, it's been a couple generations and we still don't have that Frenchman coming to the rescue, but I have high hopes for maybe the third generation. Uh, Walter Fries is an editor at, can anybody tell me? Huh? Is that Harper? I think it is Harper, yeah. And frequently when there were Hollywood developments, she would write to the publishing house for that book. And um, here she's talking about, let's see, which one is this one? Do, 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 do. Oh, this is, <laughs> this, I know why I put this one in. This is some guy who calls her drunk about every six months, <laughs> pitching some movie. And apparently this time, though, it's, it really seems legit. And Annie Laurie and her staff thinks it's on the up and up, cold sober, et cetera, with a down payment and royalty, her usual deal. If this goes through, and it may this time, there's 1959, talking about old jewels, there will be a new spurt of interest in the book. This stands in for many letters by the 50s. When she's talking about film adaptations, she's talking about licensing rights, and she's talking about book sales, probably to help her fund those trips and life and sandwiches and what else? Uh, Silkin jackets, right? Um, so she realizes that the film rights have very little risk. She's extremely dismissive of Hollywood actually taking up the project. She has almost no hope that Hollywood would do a good job on the project, depending on the director. And yet there's a sort of magnetic draw to Hollywood for lots of reasons, um, bona fides being one of them. I think we're almost done. Oh, no, this one, I almost didn't put it up because I honestly can't read the name. Uh, and I don't know who this is. But it's also one of the places where I got a title shot for my talk. So this is after, or no, this is right as Cheyenne Autumn is being film licensed. And she's writing to Emmy or Ermi, I can't read it, E-M-I-R-E-E-M-M-E, -E -M -M -E. um, January 1st, 1963, she's talking about Cheyenne Autumn film adaptation, and my read on this handwriting is, I'm pretty hopeless about it, even with John Ford directing. She knew what was going to happen. Also, when the bad Crazy Horse film came out, and you saw all those letters in that 1950 period, she was getting correspondence from many, many different people saying, oh my goodness, what's, the, what's your relationship with this film? Or this film is horrible, how could you be involved? Any number of things. And also she got reports from the Sioux who were working on the film that the director of the film was carrying around a copy of her Crazy Horse while they were filming, even though there was no official acknowledgement and certainly no licensing of the film rights. 
So I think that the Crazy Horse production broke her in some ways, right? Hollywood is going to Hollywood, and Mari Sandos is going to Mari Sandos, and she, it was up to her to figure out how to navigate that to the best of her ability. And after 27, 29 years, no film ever being made, you could forgive her for thinking no film is ever going to be made, and she suggested as much in letters frequently. So, here we go. January 23rd, 1963. Today I signed a year option on Cheyenne Autumn, $1,000. There'll be no publicity. It probably won't go any further. I wasn't too anxious to let this fine piece of property go, but my name's to be included as the book author if the picture is made, and that should stir up new sales. It's all about book sales for her. So, in conclusion, I'm not sure how much time I have. Oh, perfect, I have a minute left. I did write part of my presentation, Elaine. Over time, Mari Sandos comes to terms with Hollywood. She also comes to terms with her lifestyle and how to best afford that lifestyle. Uh, Cheyenne Autumn is a horrible film. And maybe in the future, we might get a legit Old Jewels. And that would be kind of fun. I think about it sometimes, you know. Like, what would, a, what would a gritty, realistic Hollywood treatment of old jewels look like? And it'd be pretty amazing, I would have to imagine. So, with that, I conclude my discussion of Mar Sandos and Hollywood, and I thank you for your time. Saying I disagreed with you. Well, you didn't maybe disagree. You just had questions. Well, I, I do. I do want to say the last time I visited her in the hospital, it was in 65. I read this review of Cheyenne Autumn, and I read it to Mari Sandoz, and it's well, it had Jimmy Stewart, and it had, it had a wonderful cast, but it wasn't Cheyenne Autumn. But the very end, this writer wrote, they should have stuck to the book. <laughs> and she sat up in her hospital bed at St. Luke's Hospital, grabbed that and said, let me see that. <laughs> and she was pleased. And as far as I know, she never saw the film. I've never, I've ask other people and uh, nobody seems to know. What questions do you have for, uh, this was really a good paper and in depth, I've never seen it done uh, so well. Well, thank this you. It's good. Uh, one of the points you make that I totally agree with, she was always interested in her book sales and she was always pleased. She made a lot of money on some books, and that made her very happy. And I think that's all positive. That's, that's a byproduct of having success. Yep. Thank you. In her letters, did she make references to any other films or Hollywood-related people that were unrelated to her work? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So I didn't include There's many, the many things that, that, that I could have talked about. Probably the one that was the most interesting to me was there's an organization based out of New York that was fighting for better Native American film representation. And she was either a member or a really important supporter of that, of that aspect of it, but it didn't relate to Sandoz's work, so I didn't include it. Uh, yeah, I think um, there's, another, there's another instance where she mentions cinema, like foreign cinema, and, and how she appreciates that, but she doesn't have time for it. So I, 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 will, I would think she was conversant with film, but, um, but yeah, not... Not as, as my talk, not so much. Thanks, Dave. Um, are you willing to talk about Helen and Lawrence Bixby's divorce? 
<laughs> which uh, you started to talk about and then you you took another detour. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting because I don't feel like I can comfortably disclose these things in a public forum just because of the nature of the exchange. Um, but I would recommend we talk later. Does that kind of make sense? Um, someone, someone confided something to me on Twitter in a DM that based on what's transpired since, I think that they would prefer it not being shared generally. You know what I'm saying? Um, what are you saying, Jameson? Yeah. <laughs> it, requires it requires more research. Absolutely. It requires more research. Yeah. I'm on the trail. All right, yeah. Any other questions? Well, as I said, I really enjoyed this. Dave, thank you. And thank all of you. Uh, Lynn Roper, we owe her a lot. She's our president. <laughs>